Hi, I'm Patrick McFadden. Let's talk about the fundamentals of an Apache Cassandra table. There is a lot of terminology with an Apache Cassandra table and just Apache Cassandra in general. And so I'm gonna run through these things. Keep in mind, this is the place where you need to understand all this terminology because it's the most important part of a data model. And when we start digging into like the different terms and what they mean, this will make or break your data model eventually. So if you're gonna pay attention, this is the time to pay attention. So let's just start with the basics. The data model, what is that? Well, data model is not just a Cassandra topic. That is definitely something that is in every database. Every database has a data model. The type of data model each one has is gonna be different based on its capabilities. For Cassandra, this is something very specific for what it does and how it does it. So the abstract model for this is how it gathers the data, how it uses the data, and definitely how it stores the data. And I think this is one of the most important pieces that you'll understand is how Cassandra stores data because it will make your data models better. A key space is the larger part of a data model. A key space stores tables. It also stores information that's pretty critical to say replication. It stores replication data and where your data is in relation to the rest of the cluster. So the key space is a container for sure and if you're using something like MySQL or Oracle, that would be like a schema. A table should not need much explanation if you've ever worked with a database. Tables are rows and columns, right? That's what we've always seen. A Cassandra table is a little different, but it is fundamentally the same type of thing. Now, there's nuance inside of it and how we work with it. For instance, how the primary key works with that table. But the tables are contained inside the key space. A partition is where we start getting into more specific Cassandra-related topics. A partition isn't exactly a new topic for any database, but it's very specific on how it works with Cassandra. One of the things that you need to understand about a partition is this is really where you can make or break your data model, right there. So we're gonna dig into that quite deep. So a row of data is again, a pretty normal concept in databases, but this is what stores all the columns. Now, a row is contained inside of a partition, and I think that's one of the interesting differences between Cassandra and, say, a relational database. A column is the same as what you would see in a normal relational table. However, we treat columns a little differently. Column, like row, very similar to what a relational database does, but these are the individual items inside of a row. A primary key, now that is a part of Cassandra that is very unique in a lot of ways, and something that I'm going to dig into quite a bit. I've talked about this a lot in the past where primary key is the most important part of your data model. I'm gonna prove it to you in this module. The primary key does two things. It guarantees uniqueness of the record, but it also defines the placement of that record in your cluster. And that's the unique part. The partition key, which is a part of the primary key, is that part that shows where in the cluster your data is. This is a pretty key concept and we'll go into it quite a bit. And this is also an operations topic, but today, we're just gonna talk about the data model portion of that. And clustering column. Again, pretty unique to how it works in a primary key with Cassandra, but clustering columns give you some order in your data, and that's the unique part of it. We'll dig into how you can get that ordering and how you can control it, and how it can be a really useful and powerful part of your data model. This is a pretty good graphical overview of what a table looks like. By the end of this module, you should be able to explain this to somebody you know about what a table actually is in Cassandra. We can't have a database without data types. Types are important. And this is a very crucial part of a Cassandra database because inside of that database is typed columns. It's not just random data. There are some databases out there that are schemaless that don't really assign type or try to guess type as the data is being put in. No, you have to define the types in your columns before you do any data work. Understanding the data type is really critical to your data model because that's what sorts things gets in the right order. It also controls how that data is stored on disk, which is really critical for say read speeds. And that's why we're gonna really dig into these pretty hard. If you look at these right here, these are just normal text types. The text data types are ASCII text varchar. Now, varchar is probably one that you're used to seeing quite a bit if you work with relational databases. There's not a lot of difference between these three, and that's really the critical part here. Um, the ASCII one is different because of the different character set is using US ASCII, which is very limited. Normally you'd use text or varchar because UTF-8 gives you a larger character set. And that is probably where your data is gonna be anyway. So just use those. ASCII is very specific, but it does exist as a type. 
Now keep in mind that types are going to do some validation as well. They're there for validation. So if you try to put in a character that's outside of ASCII character range, it will throw an error. And that's what we expect from our types. Types help constrain. They give you enforcement. And these types will restrain you against text data types, which aren't as, as onerous as others, which are probably more useful. We'll get into those. For instance, integers. Integers are definitely needing to be constrained. All the different types in here need to be controlled. Whenever you input data into it, you are expecting a certain type. For instance, a tiny int or a small int, big difference. If I put in text characters, not okay. Big int, that's another one. If I don't have a type that's large enough and I use an int when I really need a big int, again, it's gonna throw an error. That may be you trying to enforce your data types so that you have application logic that uses that data properly. Now, there are some others in here that are very similar, but look at the different types and how they work. For instance, a variant is very unique, but it's one that is useful in those cases. Floats and doubles, again, something you probably already know about if you use any kind of programming language that uses static types. The biggest difference being float is small, double is huge, but those are really there to enforce. So if you try to put in something that's a float that's not a float, then you're gonna get an error. The date types, this is one of the ones that I really love. I love a good time series data model and I use these a lot. The date, it should make sense to you if you've ever worked with Unix systems that of course everything in the world started on January 1st, 1970, right? <sighs> let's just use date a lot less anymore because let's face it, at this point, we're gonna run out of 32-bit unsigned integers around 2032. So let's just not use date anymore. Duration is a different type of number and that's really now the new cool thing, using a signed 64-bit integer. It won't run out of space, at least in your career, so don't worry about it. Time and timestamps are ones that I use quite a bit. Timestamp probably the most because that's the one that fits into most of the data models you get from application logic. Now this is a 64-bit signed integer since Epoch. Now that means that it has a lot of room to grow. It's not gonna overflow in 2032. Good, just use timestamp. Most of the data models you'll see me give examples about use timestamp pretty effectively in a time series data model. The other two types here, UID and time UUID, are really critical when you're working with a distributed system. Pretty common concept within distributed systems. For Cassandra, we use these in our data model quite effectively. UUID stands for Universally Unique Identifier. And if you're in the Microsoft world, GUID, Globally Unique Identifier, same thing, it's just this really big number. It's a 128-bit number that is generated in a way that's more or less guaranteed to be somewhat random in the universe. I'm sure there's a way to prove that it isn't always going to be completely random, but for the world we live in, it works awesome. And it gives you enough room to work with with 128 bits where you can rely on that to be a unique number when it's generated. The time UUID is part UUID and part timestamp. It gives you this best of both worlds where I can store some time information, but have it be unique. Now, if you think about when that's useful, if you have exactly the same timestamp and you wanna make sure that two things are stored separately and they're unique, you slap a UUID on it and you're good. But a time UUID is really different in a way that it isn't all 128 bits, 64 bits of the time UUID is time, and 64 bits is the UUID portion. So it's not the full 120-bit UUID. Good enough, though, with the time component and the UUID component, it's pretty unique and very useful in a lot of data models. The specialty types, now we call it that because we don't really have anywhere else to sort them, let's face it. These are the ones that are, have to be there no matter what, but they have kind of unique names. So, for instance, blob. Blob is one that just throws some data in there. There's no validation. It's kind of whatever. It's really useful if you have no idea. Again, this is where you can find yourself if you just have no idea what your type is gonna be. Make a blob. You could throw anything into it. Inside of the database, it's just a hexadecimal string. Could be anything. It could be an image. It could be a text string. You never know. Boolean is that sharp yes or no, true or false, zero or one. And Booleans, of course, are very useful in any kind of programming logic, but you can store the true or false as a data model in Cassandra. A counter type is pretty interesting because it's very unique to Cassandra and is covered quite extensively in another module. 
But in a nutshell, what that is, is this is what it says. You can use it to increment, decrement, counts. And it stores that as a 64-bit signed integer. Again, it'll be covered quite extensively in another module, but that's what that counter type is. And then finally, we have the INET type, which I think is amazing. It is an internet address, and it validates either an IPv4 or IPv6 address. Really useful in those situations where you need to store an internet address, and you want to make sure it's properly validated and sorted. That is one of the unsung heroes of the Cassandra data types. I've seen it used in so many places, like for instance, fraud detection or in time series data models. It's a good trivia question you could stump somebody with. Is there an internet type inside of Cassandra? Yes or no? The answer is yes, and this is how it works. So this is all the terminology you need to know about a Cassandra table, and there's quite a bit of it. From the types to the different things like partition keys and primary keys and columns and rows, all of this terminology will be used throughout this course. The more you know these things, the easier it's gonna be for you in the long run. So if you have to rewatch this, go ahead and rewatch it, learn the terminology, refer to the documentation, but this is it. These are the things you need to know.